Hi, I'm Caleb. I'm a pastor here at Crossroads, and I just want to say thank you for downloading or streaming this sermon. I hope it is a blessing to your heart. However, I hope this sermon is only supplemental to your life and doesn't replace your commitment to a local church, a church in your community where you can pour out your blessings and your abilities that God has given you. But until then, enjoy this sermon, and I hope it is a blessing as you hear God's word. It's good to be back with you. Those of you who are here weren't here last week. My name is John Russell, and for 40 years, I was at the same church in northern Kentucky, just across the river from Cincinnati, Lakeside Christian Church, and now I fill in in various places, interims and things like that, churches in between situations, and so that's why I was invited here. I'm going to ask you to do something, and, and you know, some of you are going to be, I don't think you'll be uncomfortable, but this week I saw several places say it's hokey or whatever. But when 4th of July falls in the middle of the week, you know, it, it, we, we kind of do some stuff. But I'm just going to ask you to stand with me, would you please? And we're going to just sing God Bless America. I don't care what your, what your party is or whatever, you need, and I need God to bless America. So let's just sing it together one time through, and then you can be seated. All right, will you join me? God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountain to the prairie to the oceans white with foam, God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. You were good. You were good. Sit down. Sit down. Thank you. Thank you. That was just for me, so I appreciate that. <clears throat> you know, there's a plethora of TV shows going on now, or what I would classify as the fixer-up genre. There's Flip and Flop, and there's uh, Love It or List It. There's Fixer Upper. You know, people that go to property that is extremely damaged or maybe sometimes has, has really been left alone, and they do marvelous things to really fix it up. Now, I, I have a high, high regard, and some of you fall in this category, I have a high regard for people who can see a mess and can visualize a prize. Some of you can go to, to flea markets and you can see little trinkets there, and in your mind you see, boy, you know, if I polish that up or if I change it around or turn it into something else, it could really be valuable. I have a, a great regard for that. You can look at a piece of old rough wood and you can see it, well, if I can sand that down or I can move it around, it becomes a prize priceless capacity. You know, <clears throat> or you walk into a house, and immediately when you walk into a house, you can see a wall, and you can say, well, I would move that wall, or I would do this, or I would do that. I just do not have that eye. My wife Susan's with me this week, and I, I think that she secretly wishes she'd married one of the property brothers rather than <laughs> Melvin the mess up, but that's just me. I just do not have that eye or ability, but I, I've watched people rip up carpet and find a, 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 a sort of a dull, tarnished wood, and immediately they almost begin to drool. Boy, that can be redone. That can be restored and really changed. Now, I'm told that, particularly those of you who are in construction, that remodeling is kind of simple when nobody's living in the house. But some of you have gone through a remodel situation trying to live through it and all the dust and all the things going on. You got a refrigerator because you're doing your kitchen. It's in the middle of your family room along with your stove and everything else. And it's quite a difficult. And most contractors tell me that, <clears throat> that remodeling is twice as hard and sometimes twice as costly as just ripping something and just starting from scratch. And, and can you believe that people actually now vacation to Waco, Texas in the middle of no place just so they can be around Chip and Joanna Gaines. Great couple, great Christian couple, but a couple of years ago were total anonymity. So my point is this, restoration of property is really, really hard. 
and it's difficult. I, 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 we went through it in kitchen and family room and living room, dining room. I have found there's four stages of any renovation in a home. Number one is design. Number two is financing. Number three is startup. And number four is divorce. That's about, <laughs> that's about as honest as I can get with you, all the change orders and everything else that happened. Because you know, you have trouble finding out what needs to be gotten rid of and what can be kind of restored or kind of brought into a new life. That's why I always have enjoyed and appreciated the phrasing that the Bible has about when we come to Jesus Christ to be our Lord, it's like a new birth, a new life. And statements like, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Or the old is gone, the new has come. And transformed of the old person, the old Adam nature has been buried with Christ and rises to a new life. You see, the reason I like that is because, let's be honest, we can really, all of us, make a mess of our life. And it's nice to know that though our sinful habits are so prevalent, Christ offers us a glorious opportunity to take it all away and to let it start fresh again. You've seen this phrase, perhaps. God formed me. Sin deformed me. Christ transformed me. And I, I you know... The difficult is there's, when we go through a transformation, it's probably not difficult to figure out what needs to be gotten rid of or what needs to be taken away. The Bible talks about specifically sins that damage our heart that need to be taken away and never brought back. And we do well to start there because I think it's important. But the reason we get into Scripture in, in Crossroads is not so that we can master the Scripture, but so the Scripture can master us. And there is a restoration that I think he needs in every church and every life that maybe we don't really look at as clearly and as honestly as we should. David said in his famous Psalm 23, remember that line? He said, he restores my soul. You see, one of the purposes of sin is to not only cause you to stumble, but to destroy the uniqueness of your personality and to try to make you like everyone else, pre-fertilizer for this world. You see, the difference in you and, 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 and I is the fact that we are not alike, that there is a necessary restoration in all of our lives to restore the uniqueness that sin has a tendency to dull or to discourage. Brilliantly, it takes off the shine when it comes into our life, and the uniqueness of your individual spirit and my individual spirit is lost into a sameness. And the Holy Spirit comes along when Christ comes and says, not only do I need to remove what is bad in your life, I need to sparkle and shine what maybe has a dull luster in your life, in your church, in your home. The character and the heart and the giftedness that God has presented is a spark of specialness that only you and only this church has. Can we restore that and find that? David sought person in his darkest hour. You go a little later in Psalm 51, he said this, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. That's what we hope that Crossroads is going to do. That's what we hope that your life will begin to do. The restoration of that broken king, because he was allowed to be, because he had a soft heart and he had a sharp eye and a keen spirit. And God heard his prayer and God granted by his grace and his spirit made him something special again. Now the good thing about it is he isn't the only one. You go through all the Bible and you see that over and over again. There was an executive, a very powerful executive, who seemed to be able to lead constantly people into great, great situations. But he had a bad temper. And he ended up killing a man. And he ended up disobeying his overseer. 
But God restored Moses and allowed him to become a great, influential, powerful man. There was a judge who was extremely well-liked, but he had a she problem, a he-man with a she weakness. And you know who I'm talking about, Samson. But God used him even in the final hours of his life in miraculous and great ways and the specialness of his life. There was a jabber jaw in the New Testament. The guy couldn't quit talking. He always talked himself into trouble, always said too much. When it came time for the church to start in Acts chapter 2, Peter was transformed and shined and polished and to become the spokesman for the church. There's another guy who was really angry with the Christians and did everything he possibly could. But Paul took Saul after closing his eyes and then opening again to see what he really could be in the right hands and in the right way. And all throughout history, you see that happen and occur. People like Billy Sunday and Dwight L. Moody and even Billy Graham that step up and, and the most unlikely characters that seem scarred beyond terrible recognition suddenly become transformed and then polished into these useful and very powerful people. The name Wayne Smith may not be familiar to many of you, but I, I went to his funeral. Wayne Smith grew up in Cincinnati and he was, <clears throat> after high school, decided to become a carpet salesman. But his preacher challenged him, even though he was doing quite well selling carpet, that maybe there was more to his life than he had to offer. He says, this is what you want to do with your life. So he began to sort of search himself and decided to go off to Bible college. And he went, and he was a terrible student. He really struggled. And he tried to, to preach on weekends, and he had trouble writing sermons and everything else. But he had this personality that was so attractive and a laugh and a smile that was so genuine that people were attracted to him. And eventually, he took a job in a struggling church in Lexington, Kentucky, by the name of Southland Christian Church, and he built it up to one of the biggest churches in the state of Kentucky and also in the country. And he was so powerful. And I went to his funeral, and there were hundreds and hundreds of preachers who traveled many miles just to be there because he influenced us too, as well as his own local congregation. I saw grown men cry because of his influence there in that moment. And I myself cried <clears throat> when I, I remember seeing a day or so afterwards a video online that they interviewed him just a couple weeks before he died. And he talked about how he hoped to be remembered and how he hoped to be able to, to have an influence even after death. And, and he was so thankful God used him. He didn't understand it. And you can tell as the interview kept going on, he was get, getting a little bit antsy. And that twinkle in his eye came back and he said, stop, I got to tell you something. He said, did you hear about the judge who had a woman before him who had shoplifted a can of peaches? And this judge was notorious. And the judge said, madam, how many peaches were in that can? And she said, seven, sir. He said, well, I think it's only appropriate that I sentence you to one day in jail for every peach in the can. Suddenly, her husband jumped up in the gallery and shouted out, Judge, she also stole a can of peas. <laughs> I miss you, old man, and I miss you terribly. God the Creator knew a uniqueness in that guy, and he created you and he created me for doing something if we allow ourselves to be renewed. And he created this church, allowed to come into existence, if we have this transformation, this renewal that has, this restoration that we want. Well, you say, what needs to be what I would classify God's Spirit to transform us? What needs to be restored in our renovated life? I, I think there are four things. And I'm only going to talk about the last one. You're going to be glad for that because we can go on forever. I think, first of all, what needs to be is a restoration of divine authority. If God's God, how about we let him be God? And that's important because everybody has an authority in their life, and it's not God, then you have to say, who is it? It's probably you. Is that really what you want to go by? And the church has to always understand that we're always one generation away from extinction if God is not God within our walls. I've seen a bumper sticker you have too that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it for me. That's pretty good. But you know what's not right? Here's what the bumper sticker should say. God said it, that settles it whether I believe it or not. Because if he's God, then I have to restore and let that image come alive again in me and in my church. 
Secondly, I think there needs to be a restoration of the sacredness of life and marriage and home. Boy, we have allowed these three to take a serious beating within our culture, and we have allowed so much junk to form in that we say today we can't even define what marriage really is. And really, we've gotten to the point where people are being good, beginning to question the validity of it any more than the culture. Do you realize the year 2012 was a watershed year? And what happened? Most of us didn't, weren't even aware. But 2012 in the United States was the first year that more children were born outside of wedlock than were born within. Born to non-married couples and born to never married couples and everything else. And it's a sociological change that really was kind of a, a tremendous shift that we don't even talk about anymore. Where is marriage? Where is life? Where is the home? Third is the restoration of honor and character. One of the new aspects of the new birth, I think, is highlighting the two elements that we <clears throat> allowed when our honor and character is diminished, we allow the question of the legitimacy of our birth to happen. But I, I don't know about you, but I, I am so just <clears throat> almost having the hair on the back of my neck stand up, the coarseness of the, of the conversation on, on television and in the news and in politics today and the language that we hear and the things that are said or written, you know, honor and character and integrity have taken a beat. I want this church and I want your life to be standing strong and, and with the character and to say, there we can find help because those people are honest. Those people are trustworthy. Those people keep their word. All right. Let me just do the last one. You know what needs to be restored in your life and mine? The restoration of a child likeness. You know, people look at this one passage of Scripture I'm about to give you, and they'll say, well, it's kind of a little pleasant break. It's not too much theologically incorporated in there. It's just sort of a thing was thrown in there. But I don't think so, because all four gospel writers included this. Listen to it as it's recorded here. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you're never going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Now, according to Jesus, if I read that correctly, a significant act in the maturing process in the restoration of a, is the restoration of a childlike spirit. Now, please don't confuse. Please don't confuse childishness with childlikeness. There are several passages in Scripture that really condemn childish behavior. Paul said to the Ephesians, I want you to become mature. Then why, therefore, you'll no longer be infants. You'll be blown here and there by the winds of craftiness and shifting change. But instead, you'll finally grow up into him. The childishness that needs to be eliminated is that selfish, demanding spirit that always is saying, my needs first and my needs only is the only way that we can succeed. And it's a gullible and fickle attitude that is so easily swayed that there is a susceptibility that is so frustrating. And it's so easy, a childish spirit becomes so easily upset with the trivial things that really don't matter. And because of that, become a divisive wedge within the life of any church as well as the life of any family. I think I told you last week, since my retirement from the located ministry, it's been my privilege to assist and, and to consult numerous churches of varying size and, and, and locations and need. And I confess to you, some places I've been, it is really, I've seen some churches having some, some real inconsequential decisions that have real consequential actions. Some petty things that they allow to become too important. And, and, and you know, really, and I confess to you in trying to show them sometimes how infantile this action is, they always want to say, well, the other side started it first, you know, just like your kids used to do when they were little. If they hadn't started doing it this way, we wouldn't have had this reaction or so on and so forth. You know, Jesus had this so 
much in his life. The Pharisees always were accusing him and his disciples of, of, of what they thought were tragic things. They don't wash their hands in the right way. They pick corn on the Sabbath day. He's healing on the Sabbath. You know, inconsequential things, which are a lot easier to spot in other people than it is in ourselves, isn't it? I don't know. Some of us just have a petty spirit sometimes. There was a guy who became a member of the congregation years ago where I served, and he told me up front, he said, now I'm kind of particular, so I, I may butt heads with you once in a while. Well, he was right about that. But anyways, you know, he always had this, this sort of a real legalistic super type spirit. Let me just give you one example. He had a grandson, I think it was a grandson, or a relative, a relative of his baptized by somebody who had never baptized somebody, and the kid was frightened to death of water, and as he was going under, he threw his hand up in the air, and uh, so he's baptized. Well, this <coughs> member said, he's got to do it again. And I laughed. I said, why, why do you say that? I said, well, he's, you know, his hand was out of the water. I said, well, you think he's going to go through heaven with one arm? And, and uh, he looked at me. Yeah, he believed that. And so I'm thinking like, well, you know, this is going to go on. Well, anyways, he was there. <coughs> I retired. And I, I made the decision. This is just me. I made the decision I would not go to church there for a full year. I'd been there because I didn't want anybody to, to you know, ask my opinion or do anything. And I think the new guy really had to have a start. And I said, I only come back if he invites me to come back and all. So I'm not going to go. So within that first year, I was, I was there, in, you know, in the community, but I had not gone to church there. I was going other places. And I'm having a, a, a lunch in Wendy's with my grandkids. You know, they are, they are out of town. They were in. I had a good time. And suddenly from behind me, somebody puts his hands on my shoulder. And I look back up, and here's this guy that I told you about. And I looked at him and said, hey, good to see you. So I lied. Okay. So I, I, I lied. I, I, I thought. He said, yeah, John. He said, well, I really miss you. And I almost said I miss you too, but I thought two lies would be too much. And all I said, oh, thank you. And he said, I don't go to church there anymore at Lakeside. I said, oh, okay. He said, aren't you going to ask me why? I said, no, but I think you're going to tell me. <laughs> Anyways, he said, yeah. They moved the communion table. A stinking piece of furniture was moved from one place to another. Imagine that. Man, had I known that's all it had taken, I'd have moved that sucker a long time ago. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord, that's probably not right. Jesus said, boy, that destructive childishness needs to go away. Instead, I want you to have and restore in you a childlike spirit. Then maybe it's been tarnished. Maybe it's been dulled in your life. Has it? Sometimes it can happen and we're not even aware. Let me just give you a couple things I think he was referring to. Number one, an innocence. You know, there sometimes can be a hardening of our spirit because after we see so much, we tend to become more cynical, don't we? And we often develop and lose, because of the hardness, the sponge-like attitude of innocence that child has to just soak up and drink up knowledge. Have we lost that? Well, how about the joy? The real joy that children can discover over the simplest thing. Can we look at with a fresh light, you know, kids looking and searching for laughter, and they discover excitement in the simplest of things, and they drink deeply from every experience. A couple years ago, I did something I had never done when I lived where I lived. I decided I was going to go to the county fair. I've gone to state fairs. Ohio has a great state fair, too. I've gone there several times. Never to a local county fair. But I was going to go take my three-year-old grandson because his mother and grandmother were going to go to a church function. Now they said, ah, you probably should reconsider. It's hot, it's sticky. You don't know whether, you know, he'll be how helpful. I said, come on, let's try it. So we got in the car, and as soon as we got in the car, boy, he said, Pop, what, what's a fair like? And I tried to explain to him. He said, what are we going to see there? He said, oh, we're going to see animals, and we're going to see rides, and we're going to see, you know, popcorn and, and, and French fries. I don't know. Oh, all these cars going to the fair, Pop? He said, I said, no, they're not all going to the fair. And we get close. Boy, I'm excited about going to the fair, Pop, he said. So we get there. Pop, Pop, what are you doing parking on the grass? You're not supposed to park on the grass. So oh, we do that at fairs. Oh, okay. Pop, is that lady going to take your money? Yeah, you're over two. She's going to take my money. And so we got up there. No, 
And it, it, let, him st let her stamp your hand. See, Papa, let, he'll stamp my hand too so you can ride and do everything. I look down at the stamp. <laughs> it shows you my tax dollars at work. It said draft. Evidently, it was an old beer stamp or whatever it was. And that's what it had on there. So yeah, let him stamp your hand. So we went out there and he's kind of cautious at first. And he was riding some of the little rides and everything else. And finally, over on the side, he discovered it's a huge maze that ended up with a huge slide. And he was going through there, and he got so excited, come down the slides, giggling. Can I do it again? Yeah, go ahead, do it again. And he'd go through, it take a while, and I could see him all the way through it. Can I do it again? Yeah, seven times in a row. He did it, and he's just laughing and joining. I said, come on, let's go see some animals. Well, you know, his parents would take him to the zoo. He wasn't too excited about cows and pigs and, and all those things. But I said, well, let's get some other things. And he kept saying, can we go back there? Can we go back there? I said, well, it's getting close time to go home. Okay. You know, I'll let you do one more thing. Well, you know what it was going to be. He's going to go back to the maze. So we went back to the maze, and there's a bunch of kids standing in line. And so I said to him, I said, now, see this boy in the blue shirt? All right, you, you follow right behind him. Don't try to push ahead. Don't do anything. Stay right behind him. And I'll meet you over here at the end. We get done. So I stepped over off to the side, and I could see him over there. And he tapped the boy in the blue shirt in front of him to get him around. And I could read his lips, and he said, my name's Emmett. That's my pop. Wouldn't you know, in this moment, how about you and I saying, I'm a Christian. Do you know my father? That's my dad. That's my daddy. Could we restore that type of spirit and excitement in this regard? And lastly, it's a sincere faith pure, unassuming, straightforward. Kids receive God's salvation without any pretense, no hypocrisy. You know, as kids, little kids rely on their parents for their daily needs. We need to rely and depend more on our Heavenly Father for our daily needs too, but we get so cynical, so discouraged, so upset. I don't want you to lose the wonder. As an individual or as a church, that God has chosen you to live in this time to be his ambassadors. This is a day God has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it because he's given it to me. Somebody once said, you know what? You have to go out of your way to teach a child there is no God because it's naturally instinctive within them to trust and believe there is. Statistics tell us that 83% of those who come to Christ do so before the age of 18. So we've got to make the salvation of our kids, the number one priority as a church because nothing else is more important, is there? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus said, you know what? This is what my kingdom is really like. To those who are reborn by the water and the spirit and become renovated, they discard the destructive things and the destructive attitudes, and then they let me polish and shine up the childlike wonder and innocence and faith that's so unique to your character and so unique to you allowing your creation to be discovered. David and Shirley Phillips have ministered for a number of years and northern Cincinnati area, several small churches. David always saw himself as sort of a small church pastor. Late in their life, David and Shirley welcomed a child, and, and he was born with Downs, and Stephen was precious to them, but they didn't know how far he would be able to go and how much he'd be able to be comprehend. Some of you have experience with that in your families, or you know, these are kids are so precious and so loving. And they said they just loved him, and he loved them, and all they had older kids, <clears throat> and they didn't know how much he grasped and everything, but he would be there, and every Sunday he'd sit with his mother in church, and David would preach. And David said when he was about 10, one Sunday after church was over, and he said, I shook everybody out, and Stephen was kind of hanging back. And I said, come on, Stephen, it's time to go home. And he'd stand next to a picture of Jesus on the cross, and he was standing there, and he pointed to the picture, and he touched his heart, and he said, for me, for me. And he held his nose and tilted his head back, symbolizing he, he wanted to be baptized. Now, David said, now, John, he had seen baptisms, and he was always fascinated. He always wanted to see the water and everything else. And I said, come on, Stephen, we'll talk about it so we get home. And he said he was adamant. No, for me, for me. He said, okay, listen to me. He said, these people in this church love you like we do. 
So we're not going to do this any other way. You're going to have to be able to make the decision yourself. And I'll talk to you, but when it comes time, you're going to have to say, and you're going to have to do it. He said, we didn't think too much about it. Next Sunday, he said, I got to the end of the sermon, and that time we were doing an invitation to him, he said, I got down the front, and here comes my 10-year-old son down the aisle. Big old grin in his face. Had him sit in the front row. Music stopped. He said, I said, Stephen, stand up. Stephen, why have you come? He said, he turned around, he faced the audience, and he said, God loved Stephen. Stephen loved God. Be baptized. David said, had there not been a baptistry, there were enough tears in the audience, we could have built another one right then, he said. And when I called him and asked him permission for the story, this is a couple years ago, he said, John, you're welcome to use it anytime you want. He said, I want to tell you something else. He said, my now 47-year-old son carries his Bible everywhere he goes. He can't read a word of it. But what a tremendous witness he is every single day. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant a willing spirit to sustain us. Please, Crossroads, let's have that. Let's show that first in us, then in our body. Bow with me for prayer.